Maximize the impact of your charitable donations by going to givewell.org, pick podcast, and enter Partially Examined Life at checkout. You're listening to The Partially Examined Life, a podcast by some guys who were at one point set on doing philosophy for a living, but then thought better of it. Our question for episode 294 is something like, how do we ground scientific theories? And we read Willard Van Orman Quine's essay, Epistemology Naturalized, from 1969. For more information, please visit partiallyexaminedlife.com. This is Mark Linsenmeyer in Madison, Wisconsin, and all my philosophical theories came built right into my language, y'all jive turkeys. This is Seth Paskin with only a limited alphabet of perceptual norms in Austin, Texas. This is Wes Alwyn, underdetermined by the evidence in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Hey, I want to just start by plugging. I'm doing seminars. So for each episode we do, we'll almost always do a follow-up seminar. You can find out about those at partiallyexaminedlife.com slash seminars or go to wesalwyn.com if you want to sign up to be alerted when I do them. I will be doing one on Quine. So this was something that was on our list for a long time. We did some Quine a long time ago, the two dogmas of empiricism. And this is sort of the next thing that's been on the list. It's supposed to explain why Quine is sort of the analytic philosophy take on philosophy of science. Not exactly the same line of debate as Lakatos and Kuhn and those guys, though he mentions Kuhn at one point, thinks it's a silly overreaction. But Mm. he definitely has that idea of, you got a theory and there's an observation and what does the observation change about the theory? So that thing that we've talked about in several episodes is in here. It's just, he's also rooting this straight to historical empiricism to Hume and then Carnap is his immediate predecessor. So we did an episode a long time ago on Carnap's Aufbau on his project of trying to reduce all the complicated things that you'd want to say about science, maybe to statements about immediate perception, right? That's kind of what Hume wanted to do in the first place is that all we have knowledge of is our ideas, our impressions. And then when the impressions stick around a while and become stale, they're ideas. So they're all basically things from perception. And Carnap tried to do that for real. And Quine in this essay and other things he was writing at the time is explaining why that was kind of a silly idea and how uh, he wants to naturalize epistemology, make it no longer the foundation for science, but actually a part of science. What's your initial impression, Seth? (laughs) You're on the spot. This is a very strange text, uh, my perspective. I was familiar with Quine from all the analytic tradition, and I think he fits in the canon there with, you know, A.J. Ayer and, of course, Carnap and Frege, kind of like these early 20th century, early to mid 20th century analytic philosophers who were focused on language. And I expected to come to this text and be bored and disappointed. And I was surprised. First off, he's a very good writer. But the other thing is, I found the project, once we got to kind of what his turn was, typically when we're talking about skepticism about the external world in epistemology, my eyes just glaze over, right? Because deep at heart, I'm just a, even though I don't want to admit it, I think I'm a Heideggerian, where I think that question just doesn't even make sense. And after reading the Quine and then reading that secondary article that you recommended, Wes, which was also quite good, I think his project is actually quite interesting. It's not a question of skepticism so much as I was just, (laughs) you're not going to believe this. I was listening to our old quantum mechanics episode in the shower today. And there's a point during that episode at which Wes says something to the effect of, Heraclitus was Socrates's and Plato's skeptic in the same way that Hume was for Kant. So Kant was responding to Hume's skepticism and and in a certain way, you know, Socrates and Plato were responding to Heraclitean skepticism about the reality of the reality of the world or what we can know because of the changeability. And in a certain way, that's funny because it's an odd framing for this discussion because Quine is taking on skepticism and taking it seriously, but at the same time, he's making a move that to me is kind of oddly Heideggerian, where he's saying, look, I'm not going to deny or quibble about the existence of things in themselves or epistemic access to real things. What I really want to know is, how does knowledge happen? How do we even build knowledge from what seems to be a relatively limited set of perceptual experiences? 
And what he means by that is something to the effect of how is it that we build concepts from this limited set of perceptual experiences, which in turn allow us to characterize them in a way that becomes scientific? And then how can we trace that back so that we can have some validity about our scientific characterization of the world? And that's a surprisingly interesting question. If you take the position, as the commentator said about Quine, that we don't have any kind of a priori concepts that we can bring to bear in advance. So anyway, I found it kind of invigorating and interesting, and it was chunk-sized, just about the right bite to take for me. <laughs> like, not too much, along with the secondary literature, it was just about enough reading. So We did two dogmas of empir- empiricism, right? And uh, On What There Is, is the name of the other essay. Yep, those two. Yeah, it's funny, I had written a... Uh, kind of angry essay about on what there is in grad school at UT because all of the, the analytic philosophy was just so bizarre and horrifying to me when I first encountered it. And I just <laughs> couldn't figure out what the hell was going on beyond the sense that it was just dry and soulless and, and all that. Just it, it seemed confusing and not just confusing because it, I didn't know enough about it, which I didn't, but confusing because it just seemed to be missing the point, which, you know, one would see if one just knew more about Kant. <laughs> Now reading Quine, I think I don't remember what my experience was with our last recording on Quine. I think I was more positive, but I found very interesting and it prompted me to do a lot of extra reading, including the one I'll recommend listeners is Peter Hilton's Quine. That's part of the Arguments of the Philosophers series by Rutledge. There's another one by Gary Kemp, Quine, A Guide for the Perplexed, also very good. And I think they wrote the Stanford Encyclopedia article on Quine together. But My take on this is that Quine still takes skepticism seriously. So this is what I think we need some element of skepticism in order to take epistemology seriously as a, as a project, even if we naturalize it. So to take skepticism seriously, the way Quine puts it at one point is just that we want to figure out the ways in which theory is underdetermined by evidence. And theory is a big word, but it, it means everything from more robust, abstract scientific theories, but it also just means any kind of talk about physical objects in the world, physicalist discourse. So what Hume is doing epistemologically when he tries to say, hey, look, we have all this physicalist discourse about there being these objects out there and that they're causally related. Well, what we get in terms of immediate sensory evidence, all these different sense impressions, it really underdetermines everything that we think about those objects. So causality is unsupported and things per se are unsupported except as bundles of successive sense impressions. Those are theoretical constructs so they're underdetermined by the data, which is why rationalists wants to come along and say actually the things we know best are intellectual intuitions of these very clear ideas. After all, this is what science is about. What do we know better than causality? What do we know better than extension? says Malebranche. We have immediate intellectual access to those things. So our epistemology is based not on sense data, but on those rationalist categories. That's what makes epistemology and skepticism of some form interesting. It's the sense that what we think we know is underdetermined by the inputs, let's say. Where Quine is going to end up is he's just going to say, look, what this turns into, what Hume's project turns into with Carnap and the logical positivists is this attempt to reduce physicalist discourse to sense data or to show how you can construct that discourse and therefore all of science and scientific theory out of sense data. And for various reasons, we have to give that up. That's not going to work. But once we give that up, we're kind of free to, because we're no longer trying to do something deductive and we can't be accused of circularity, we can actually use science and psychology in particular in order to investigate the foundations of science so we start looking at language acquisition in infants for instance because right what is theory all about and physicalist discourse it's all embedded in language and so we look at instead of saying hey how do we construct physicalist discourse out of sense data we say hey let's observe infants being bombarded with having their sensory inputs irradiated right (laughs) with light and other inputs and let's see psychologically how the construction actually happens this is like an empirical thing. We don't have to do a rational reconstruction. We can actually look and say, do some cognitive psychology and say, hey, how does the mind construct all of this stuff from the inputs? How is language acquired as opposed to how is it built up? 
the picture of science that includes philosophy that he comes up with is some kind of, you were saying cognitive psychology, cognitive science was supposedly my specialization in grad school, though I drifted away from that pretty quickly, ends up being something that I would be less interested in. I think there's a reason that we haven't done texts that are trying to get, let's use neurological data to see exactly how beliefs are built out of sense data. That's the kind of thing that we would want here. And I'm not sure, you know, if it's just, well, historically, we hadn't gotten to there yet. And now we're approaching that. But that seems to fall short of, you know, Seth, you'd said you found doing science stuff a little less interesting because it seems to go out of date so quickly. And also, it's just as philosophy people, we're sort of interested in the bigger picture. As long as we have some sort of sketchbook of like schematically how these things get put together, you know, is it gestalt? Is it synthesized from little atomic bits? Those kind of larger categories of theory are more interesting to me than the specifics. You know, and I don't see any evidence that Quine in any part of his career gets into the specifics. Like he is a philosopher. He's laying groundwork of here's how philosophy and science should fit together. Not that he actually wants to do cognitive science himself. Yeah, we don't have to do cognitive science. He probably doesn't really want to do it either. <laughs> he just wants to point to it and say, hey, people can do that. That's what's so great about being a philosopher. <laughs> you just sort of assign things. Yeah. I do the big picture stuff. <laughs> I'm an idea guy. I, I communicate the plans, the client's plans to the engineers, and then they do it. <laughs> yes. To quote Office Space. But I, you know, I wanted to say that in a way, I think Quine is actually getting back to the origins of epistemology with this idea because it does all start with cognitive science. Modern science is sort of what puts skepticism on steroids because people observe, you know, they're coming up with theories of light in the early modern period and they're saying, hey, wait a minute, we see different colors because there are different wavelengths of waves or particles going into or frequencies of particles going into our eyes. And Galileo says, look, there are primary qualities and secondary qualities, and the secondary qualities reduce to the primary qualities, and you get all that stuff. That is where epistemology really takes off because of that early cognitive science stuff. And how do we start to explain our perceptions and much less our you know, more abstract ideas in terms of actual inputs, in terms of what actually happens between us as physical objects and then the things that affect our senses. So an interesting mechanism that he uses in this essay, which we haven't really touched on yet, is the idea of translation. So in trying to figure out what the empirical content of a sentence is, right? If I make a sentence, and as we were saying, Carnap wants to reduce that to, I have perception, you know, sensation of red in front of me at time T, whatever, you know, some kind of basic sentences like that and build theories out of those. Well, the way that Quine wants to say, well, what would you actually do if you met somebody that didn't speak your language at all and you're trying to figure out by just like pointing at stuff and what his words meant? Like, let's go up to a tree and point at it. And I say tree and he says Goomba. And I'm like, okay, I guess Goomba means tree. Like, and how you would actually build things up out of that. And that is a way of saying there's an assumption there. I hadn't really thought about this based on, we were just talking about in our symbolism episodes, this very kind of thing, but how that makes that Humean empirical assumption that whether or not the belief or the trees have bark or what, you know, whether or not a sentence can be somehow reduced in this Carnapian way to observation sentences, let's say, still that is the only way that we can communicate with each other or the way we would start at least the the way we'd get started, like we couldn't necessarily use this ostension to teach each other logic. That's a level of abstraction higher. But we sort of are assuming that there are at least some sentences where I can tell what you mean without knowing your language because you and I are presumably having the same perceptual experience. That I think I'm looking at the tree, you're looking at the tree. Therefore, whatever's coming out of your mouth probably is referring to that thing. I didn't realize that we're all, he's saying, empiricists in the way that we learn language in the first place. So I think we are, although, you know, according to Hilton, he's actually a little bit friendly to some of the a priori stuff as well, because there's the question of salience, right? Are you pointing to the tree? Are you pointing to the bark? Are you pointing just to oblong standing things? Are you pointing? So we have these things called similarity spaces, and some of that stuff is just defined by how the brain is structured based on evolution and all that stuff. But putting that aside, for Quine, ultimately, this comes down to basic sentences spoken in the context to us and in front of us 
and ultimately by us, you know, as we acquire language when we're infants in the context of sensory stimulation, basically. So it's not necessarily ostension that does the work early on for language acquisition, right? It's something not unrelated to that, but I think something a bit more complicated. We know the general problems with the ostension, right? This is the Augustine, right, who proposed that this is the theory of language acquisition. Quine's not that naive. He's very clear in the essay that there's talking about the social component. It's not as fully explicit as some of the things we've looked at where we talk about the social element. I'm trying to think of some examples. Like the private language argument? He mentions that, or Kep Medlins mentions that. Well, just talking about Langer and talking about the social nature of language acquisition and how if you're not socialized around language speakers, you can't pick up a language, in fact. And when you miss that window when you're young... And since he's going to be talking about a genetic or a developmental aspect of it. So I think Quine recognizes that it's not just about pointing, you know, ostension is not sufficient. He's not that naive. And that's why he's trying to define the satisfaction conditions for language usage. It's not that you point at a tree and you say tree and then the child or the foreign language speaker says, huh, okay, I wonder if he's pointing at the bark or whatever. It's that through the process of using the word tree in a propositional statement. In other words, there's a context that requires more than just, I've forgotten all my analytic language. Is it the indexical, the, <laughs> the nominative? I've forgotten all those terms they use, but it's like the name is not sufficient. Learning language is not about pointing and naming. Demonstrative. The demonstrative. Predication or, yeah. So he's going to get to the point where he says something to the effect of, you can say somebody knows how to use a word or knows the language when they appropriately respond to the stimulus or stimuli in a way that most normal people would, or in the same way that most normal people would, something like that. And coming to understand and use language, he's much more use focused in the sense that you have to be able to in the appropriate context where it makes sense to utter the word tree, you would utter the word tree. And how you come about getting to that point is the question. But the one thing you know you don't get there is just by pointing and saying the name over and over again. He goes through this exercise of trying to learn, you know, imagine how you would figure out a language from somebody that doesn't speak yours at all and you don't speak theirs. And it sounds right that what you referred to Augustine's position is the starting point. But as Wes was saying, that there are complexities, and that's actually his point. And apparently, this book, Word and Object, which I thought was just another essay, I'd never actually looked at it, but no, it's a 300 page book, is all, I guess, a large thing that it does is build up this whole idea of translation and how it is problematic, such that we actually then get something that speaks very directly to what we were talking about with Kuhn and Lakatosh and stuff like that, that yes, you have these, what seem like observation sentences, and it seems like, oh, you know, this is a tree, and a lot of they can say in their language, and we think, like, we've started, but once you get into the center, and you start trying to make, like, you know, trees are material objects, or something like that, then, like, how in the hell would you, you couldn't use ostension to determine that, so he comes up with this idea of indeterminacy of translation, so it actually becomes that it's not that these individual sentences, in fact, even the individual sentence, this is a tree, is part of a theory, right? The whole language is kind of like a theory, like Lakatosh called it a research program, or Kuhn called it a paradigm, that it's a web of beliefs. And this was in our past Quine episode, I recall. You know, So whenever you're trying to figure out what somebody means, you can't just try to figure out the individual sentences. That's not the unit of meaning. The unit of meaning is in the theory as a whole, because it could be just that maybe they don't recognize that that's a tree. Maybe, you know, you think that's a tree, but they think that that is, you know, what you would call a large piece of grass or something like that. Yeah. A tree is already a theory and any physical object is already a theory. Like this comes down to like Husserlian phenomenology, right? What do I see of the chair in front of me? You know, I see one angle one perspective and my theory includes the idea that there's something in the back of it and if i walk around it i'm going to see the back of it that it's a three-dimensional object that it's resistant to touch all sorts of stuff that go well beyond the immediate sensory experience and this is what carnap tries to do is he tries to say hey i'm going to show you how to translate all that physical object theoretical physical object language into these fundamental statements about 
sense data. Like yeah, conjunctions of them. Yeah, so very mathematical and abstract ultimately, but you know it involves and it's not carried out. He points to the whole project, but he doesn't carry it out. But the idea is that you talk about placing specific colors at points in space, right? And that everything could ultimately be reduced to that sort of talk. So with Quine, like an observation sentence, I don't think this is a tree would be an observation sentence. It's too theoretical. I might be wrong about Mm. that. I think something like, hey, this is sweet would be closer, right? And maybe we can only talk about how close and how far away things are to being observation sentences, right? Ultimately, his definition is that it's just going to be whatever is in closest causal proximity to the stimulation of our sensory receptors. He's going to give a kind of more externalist account of what it means to be an observation sentence, you know, something that leans much more on concurrent sensory stimulation than on what he calls collateral information, which is all that theoretical stuff, right? All that additional stuff that might make me want to say, hey, that's a tree, as opposed to, hey, that's a rough brown blob (laughs) or rough, Mm -hmm. you know, brown cylindrical thing or whatever. And just like you could have a different Kuhnian paradigm or a different Lakatoshian research program that, you know, very different theoretical apparatus that is supposed to explain the same observations. So for Quine, this idea of indeterminacy of translation means that the theory as a whole, the language as a whole, you could have multiple languages which mean very different things in the sort of colloquial sense of meaning. It's a very problematic word for him. But you can have different theories that account for the same observation. So I think ultimately, which is the proper kind of observation sentence? He kind of raises that as, this is something that the people in the Vienna Circle in the 30s argued over, and it's kind of a moot question. He says, like, if you have to insist on something, fine. Let's talk about whatever is closest to the sensory organs. But ultimately, there are no observation sentences because there are no theory-free sentences, they're all part of a theory. And that means that you can't actually do this translation project, that it is, or rather, there are multiple ways you could do it. And it's unclear. Carnap sort of agreed with that. Like, well, maybe there are multiple ways you could cash out. Like we could explain things in terms of basic physical atomic facts, like Wittgenstein, early Wittgenstein said, as he seems to try to do in the Aufbau, just in terms of basic phenomenal Things which I just listened to the beginning of our car nap. At that point, it was like my total experience at time T. It was not red spot in this. That was something we were talking about with Wittgenstein. But these are all different ways that you could try to axiomatize, that you could try to break down into the basic principles, reality. And the fact that you can do that in multiple ways, I think, is a way of prefiguring Quine's idea that there's an indeterminacy of translation. It's just that I think for Carnap, these all have to be ultimately consistent and translatable into one another. Whereas the point of the indeterminacy of translation is you could have two sentences that actually contradict each other, both of which are correct translations of the original sentence. And this, I think, is sort of the most controversial, you know, hit you in the face point of this. Because if you think about it in, I approach an actual French speaker and I'm trying to figure out what they mean. And you're trying to do the same thing. And I decide that what they're trying to say is this thing is black. And you'd say that the person is saying this thing is not black. And somehow, according to this thesis of indeterminacy of translation, it could be that we're both right. And that just seems completely counterintuitive. So that's at least something we need to explain before we're done with here. Mm. Yeah, unfortunately, he doesn't get much into that, right? I mean, he, he mentions it, but it's unclear to me how that works. I'm not sure I fully understand the, the indeterminacy of translation. Seth, do you have any more here? Or should we just like get into the text here and start moving? Because this is what he ends up with. This is kind of the end of the essay. Yeah, I think we should start from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Let's stop for our sponsor messages. When you get dressed, you probably just have things that you just grab that are at the top of the pile. They're your go-tos, your shirts, your sweaters, your jeans. Well, I want to tell you about Buck Mason because the clothes that they sent me recently are among those things. Buck Mason's clothes are second to none. They're timeless. They never go out of style. The ones they sent me fit right out of the box. The tailored look and fit of their t-shirts was very appealing. Even after wearing them and putting them through wash after wash, they look just as good as when I first wore them. GQ calls their curved hem tee the best t-shirt in the game. And I know when I next need to replenish my supply, I will go to Buck Mason and order it. And I got to tell you, one of the things they sent me, I was very surprised, the felted chore coat, right? It's like a suit jacket, but it's casual and you wear it inside. It's not a sweater. I love it. It's like a bathrobe, but I can wear it outside. Once you try Buck Mason, they'll become your go-tos as well. Head over to buckmason.com slash P-E-L and get a free t-shirt with your first order. That's B-U-C-K-M-A-S-O-N 
dot com slash P E L to get a free t-shirt with your first order. Buck Mason dot com slash P E L. I also want to tell you about give well. It can feel great to donate money and make a difference in someone's life, but how can you feel confident that your donations are improving or saving lives effectively? You could do weeks of research to find charities, what programs they run, how effective those programs are, how the charity might use your money, or you could visit givewell.org. There you get a short vetted list of the best charities they've found at saving or improving lives per dollar. GiveWell spends 20,000 hours each year researching charitable organizations and only recommends a few of the highest impact evidence-based charities they've found. Over 50,000 donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $750 million. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save tens of thousands of lives and improve the lives of millions more. And here's the best part. GiveWell is free. GiveWell wants to empower as many donors as possible to make informed decisions about their donations. They publish all their research and recommendations on their site for free. No sign-up required. They allocate your tax-deductible donation to the charity you choose without taking a cut. I prefer the Maximum Impact Fund. It is the easiest to find on their site, and it does what the name implies. They have picked their charities for the quarter. 100% of my donation, minus whatever the payment processors are charging, goes right to the fund, and they send you a follow-up email saying, here's what impact it had. And I encourage you to go to their website and look at the past examples of this, of how much it actually costs to save a life. I think it is too easy to get cynical about charitable giving, and I really appreciate that the folks at GiveWell have just made it their life's work to make it very easy for people like us to actually make a difference without having to likewise devote a large portion of our brains to figuring out how not actually to get ripped off and have your donation go to who knows what, you know, the pockets of corrupt government officials or the executives of nonprofits. So go to GiveWell.org and pick podcast and enter Partially Examined Life at checkout to make sure that they know that you heard about GiveWell from the Partially Examined Life. Again, that's givewell.org. Pick podcast from the menu and enter the name of this show. Thanks. St. John's College is for undergraduate and graduate students who seek meaning in their lives, who ask hard questions of themselves and their world, and who dare to free their minds. In small discussion-based classes, students grapple with fundamental questions that confront us as human beings and engage with influential works by some of the world's greatest writers and thinkers. From Homer, Plato, and Euclid to Nietzsche, Einstein, Wolf, and Baldwin. This strong commitment to collaborative inquiry and to the study of original texts makes St. John's College a particularly vibrant community of learning, where students participate in lively discussions and immerse themselves in translating, writing, demonstrating, conducting experiments, and analyzing musical compositions. Through this, they learn to listen deeply and across perspectives, and to speak and reason with precision. Explore 3,000 years of human thought in just four years, or two for graduate students, on campuses in Annapolis, Maryland, and Santa Fe, New Mexico. Learn about our undergraduate and graduate great books programs, including online graduate options, at sjc.edu. pel This is from a collection called Ontological Relativity and Other Essays, released in 1969. So it's based on a lecture, I guess from earlier, but it is not, even though in this book, he makes reference to see the other chapters. It was meant to be a standalone essay, a standalone lecture. The problem statement that he starts with is, epistemology is concerned with the foundations of science. Conceived thus broadly, epistemology includes the study of the foundations of mathematics as one of its departments. Specialists at the turn of the century thought that their efforts in this particular department were achieving notable success. Mathematics seemed reducible altogether to logic. In a more recent perspective, this reduction is seen to be better describable as a reduction to logic and set theory. This correction is a disappointment epistemologically since the firmness and obviousness that we associate with logic cannot be claimed for set theory. So I'm not going to lie. I think I have a vague notion of what that means. Folks can listen to our Russell on math episode. Yeah. I mean, beyond the idea that, you know, it seemed like math could be reduced to logic, that you could take one plus one equals two, for instance, and prove that that's true from basic logical axioms, which I think they, Russell and Whitehead did, right? And there could be a mathematic, or at least they thought they did. But you had to use set theory, I think, even for them. Did they use set theory? Okay. Yeah. It's just that that was before we had our Google episode. So even that was problematic. That with Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which I don't really want to sum up, but the idea is like you can't, for any consistent theory, you can't prove all of its true sentences based on a finite set of axioms. There are always going to be some sentences that will be true according to the theory, but are not provable within it. So that by itself just busted up. And we have an episode on that. I will refer folks to. And as far as why set theory is not obvious, I have a vague sense of that. It just seems kind of crazy, right? 
you're treating sets as if they're entities and you know you could be very platonic about it and i ta'd for uh i don't know if you guys did in at ut but i ta'd for the logic sets and theory class with Kazi, who kind of wrote the textbook on it so i taught this stuff and i just was still found the whole all the set theory stuff quite bafflingly abstract you know yeah i mean i think at root and quine's gonna tease when we talk about set theory you're talking about consistency and completeness mm-hmm. and then quine makes a distinction that he calls conceptual and doctrinal so conceptual studies are concerned with meaning doctrinal with truth and it comes down to derivations that was a pretty new distinction to me to actually have those separate words for that but of course if you're doing there's what we were describing carnap is doing seems to be about meaning. But I guess it's supposed to be both, right? We prove a scientific theory by breaking it down into, well, what it really means is this set of observations. And those set of observations are what proves the theory. So it has two relations. It's a conceptual relation, a relation of meaning, and a relation of derivation. You're talking about the truth part of it. Yeah, the truth. You know, by the time we get to physical objects, what Carnap was doing was the conceptual part, like conceptual analysis, defining bodies in terms of sense data. Yeah. And then the doctrinal part, you know, when it comes to physical objects is just how do we justify our knowledge of the truths of nature in sensory terms? So justifying the truth of our statements via sense data is the doctrinal part. The conceptual part is analyzing our concepts into sense data. Right now he's at the mathematics version of this. The important thing is this structure of derivation that Mark mentioned. The way I conceived of it when I read it is something like, okay, imagine you have the ideal state is you have this very complex mathematical formula that represents some wackadoodle thing. And what you want to be able to do is prove that that thing can be constructed out of much simpler, less abstruse, less objectionable, if you will, mathematical formulas that are simple and clear. This is all the derivation aspect of it. So ideally, what you want is some subset of your notations from which you can derive all the rest of them, the mathematical language. And then ideally, what he says is that small subset of foundational terms can then be translated or represented in logic. And logic is where meaning comes in because logical structures, the meaning and the intuitiveness, the obviousness of it should be there. And then the idea would be, okay, if you build this set of terms scientifically that are all reducible to the subset and the subset is then can be mapped into logic where you can get meaning and some form of validation corresponding to our sense data, then you would have a foundation for science. But the problem is that that breaks down. Like in logic, for instance, right? You can prove like modus ponens, right? You can prove if it's the case that A then B and A then B, you can do a logical proof of that in terms of more fundamental concepts. So there's a theorem which seems obvious to us, but there's even more obvious stuff that we can reduce it down to. Well, I mean, the proof is a truth table. At a certain point, you're just defining. Essentially, yeah. I'm defining the condition, if then, right, that little arrow or whatever sign you use for conditional is defined by if they're both true, then the conclusion is true. If the first premise is true and the second one is false, then the conclusion has to be well, false. Well, you need, actually, you need to do some work. You have a lot of other assumptions to prove modus ponens. Implication, distributivity, law of excluded middle, a bunch of other stuff. So All of which... From Quine's perspective, we can claim a certain amount of certainty about. Yeah, it's they're clear and distinct in Descartes' sense. Right, yeah. and the problem is that the axioms of set theory are not as obvious and as certain as these axioms of logic, and that's where the problem comes in. But mathematics is still better than what we've been able to do for any other area of knowledge as far as this kind of derivation is concerned. The other thing to to make note of here is just that the conceptual and the doctrinal kind of interlink with each other. So the conceptual clarification serves the purpose of derivation because the clearer our terms, the easier it is to establish inferential connections between them. You know, and ultimately, right, if we were really clarifying everything and we get down to the base level self-evident truths, then we have that possible scenario, right, where we could do something like reduce math to the obvious, obvi- you know, the self-evident, clear and distinct ideas of logic, you know, to use a Cartesian way of putting it. 
But to the extent that we don't do that conceptual stuff and we haven't clarified our concepts, then our derivations, our doctrinal stuff, not as easy or not as clear, not as forceful. So having introduced this on page 71, he says, I refer to the bifurcation into a theory of concepts or meaning and a theory of doctrine or truth, for this applies to the epistemology of natural knowledge, no less than to the foundations of mathematics. The parallel is as follows. Just as mathematics is to be reduced to logic or logic and set theory, so natural language is to be based somehow on sense experience. This means explaining the notion of body in sensory terms. Here is the conceptual side. And it means justifying our knowledge of truths of nature in sensory terms. Here is the doctrinal side of the bifurcation. There's an analogous structure here. If you think of the body of natural knowledge, the subset of terms or the subset of sentences or whatever it is from which all the natural knowledge can be derived is the observation statements. But the certainty of those observation statements is to be derived from our sense experience or from sensory experience. So the parallel is that there's the certainty that comes from the axioms of logic because of their self-intuitiveness or whatever. Self-evidence. Parallel in natural knowledge is our sense experience. And then presumably there's some set of statements from which we could theoretically derive all of the rest of the natural knowledge that would be built upon that. If we are empiricists, we think that sense data, sensations, or what does Locke call them, just ideas, you know, that those are where our knowledge comes from and what it's based on. And in a way, those are what's clearest and most distinct. Whereas the rationalist, right, the sense stuff is what's least clear. And it's our a priori ideas that are clearest and most distinct. But, you know, this is kind of the two big epistemological alternatives, right? And Klein just assumes we're all empiricists and we understand that as people who embrace natural science, that if we can reduce everything to, you know, if it were just sensory terms and logic, and hey, even set theory, fine, we can live with that. <laughs> we'll live with set theory. If we really could fulfill that project, that would be amazing to construct all of our scientific discourse and talk about physical bodies and all the rest of it out of logic plus sense data. But again, it's impossible. So yes, on this page, he is talking about Hume, who made this distinction between the conceptual and the doctrinal more important because all this hopefulness that we would have is really on the conceptual side. It's like we could under, we could mm. better understand what we're saying by any given theory by translating it into terms of sense data. And right, this is what the verificationists did. If your philosophical theory does not cash out in experiential terms, if it's a theological theory, right, there's no thing that could happen in the world that could convince you that your religious views are wrong. Then that means that your religious views, according to these guys, these Vienna Circle logical positivists, have no cognitive content at all. They are not philosophy. They don't even make sense. So throw all that stuff away. This is the tradition that Quine is coming out of, but that's just meaning. He looks at Hume. Induction is something we absolutely need to do science. We need to be able to have individual observations and make generalizations based on them and think about especially causal generalizations. And so this is the whole reason that Kant had to come up with the idea that these things are a priori. The idea that everything has a cause is an a priori principle that we just come to the table with because Hume says we only know individual impressions and how these build up over time, what these reveal to us. And they do not reveal to us that everything has a cause. It's just, that's just something we expect. It is a sort of an irrational thing necessary. You know, why the stupid joke about my cousin thinks he's a chicken? You know, well, why did you get him fixed? Well, because we need the eggs or whatever. Like, so this is what induction is for the empiricist. It's like, there's no rational justification for it. But we need it. So, yeah, this is what I was getting at in the beginning with the fundamental motivation for skepticism and the idea that the evidence underdetermines our theories because our theories include induction and they include causality and they include even right, you know, spatiotemporality, which according to someone like Malebranche is also not something we get from the sense data, right? In fact, we get nothing formal. What the early epistemologists were onto was the worry that data is just data. 
the fact that we get it through our sensory receptors doesn't account for the fact that it's structured in some way, that it's formally interrelated in our system of knowledge, in our experience of the world, and that it's got to be isomorphic with, it's got to be a picture in a way of the formal structure of the external world. And then the question is, well, how does that structure get inside us? We don't have sensory receptors for forms, for structures. We only have sensory receptors for light and for particular sense data. So that's the fundamental skeptical insight. And the problem of induction is just one part of it. So general statements, and even Quine says singular statements about the future, right? You don't get any increment of certainty by the fact that they're construed as being about impressions. So as Mark said, even though it helps us conceptually, it doesn't help us on the doctrinal side. It doesn't help us gain any certainty in our inferences. In other words, science is never just going to be deduction. It's never just going to be math. It's induction, it's generalization, and therefore it never, can never aspire to mathematical certainty. Then he gets next into the conceptual advancements, right? Contextual definitions. Yeah, geez, do we need to do we need to go through Russell on definite descriptions again? I can skip us past this with a very quick summary if you want. Go ahead. You know, he's just described how there's hope on the conceptual side. We're kind of screwed on the doctrinal side. And then we get historically these conceptual advancements. So one of them are contextual definitions from Bentham, I think, where we that allows us to make our translations more advanced. So we translate thing talk into sense data talk without doing the human thing of identifying things with sense impressions or even anything else. Basically, the contextual definition is the idea that, you know, so, so for instance, to give the meaning of a term is not to give a synonym, it's not to say what its reference is, it's to show how we can translate all the whole sentences in which the term is to be used. So translate talk of bodies into whole sentences about impressions without equating the bodies themselves to anything at all. So sentences become the primary vehicles of meaning, which is something very important to Quine. Mm -hmm. The other innovation beyond the contextual definition is the fact that we've kind of brushed over this, but the idea that you know you could use set theory to kind of enhance logic in support of arithmetic, you can use that for your physicalist stuff too. You can use set theory as auxiliary concepts in trying to give an ontology of sense impressions. So you can turn bodies and their properties into sets upon sets, Quine says, of sense impressions. A quote-unquote drastic ontological move. <laughs> Right. I think we need to say a little more if we're going to okay. use it this much, just about what set theory is. Okay. And I'm not well prepared to do that. But I, I mean, I think the example that you just gave is probably good enough that you're talking about when you're grouping things together, you're going beyond the observation. Even in Carnap's thing, there had to be some, I think, fundamental undefined notion of similarity, right? Because there's this impression and yeah, this, that's his basic relation. Yeah, yeah, this this impression and then this later impression, they have to be similar. That that's even in Hume, I believe. Yeah, for Carnap, right? It's Gestalt. It's like your whole oh right, the entire sensory experience. That's basic, and then the other basic thing is a relation that there is some similarity within that Gestalt whole. You know, it could just be a pixel, but there's some similarity between one of them and the other one. So if there's similarity, that means you can put them together in a classification in a set. Mm -hmm. And you can say, this particular horse is not just the impression I have right now. It would be bizarre to say, this impression of horse I'm having right now, that is the same as horse. No, clearly a horse is an animal. It exists over time. That impression that you just had for a second there did not exist over time. It only existed in that moment. So, all right, well, let's make a set out of these mm -hmm. things. And then where it, a theory comes in, I think is when you get to that bullshit about Russell's paradox. You know, there was, you could use a description to create a set. And this creates difficulties because you could have like the set of people who cut everybody's hair. Do not belong to sets. <laughs> yes, that everybody cuts their own hair. So the question is, does the barber save himself? So whenever you start talking about sets, you can run into paradoxes like that. And that's why you need set theory because you end up talking about higher levels of sets or something like that, that this is how you solve these paradoxes is to say, well, there's a second level language that I can talk about the first level of. So this is what I think makes the set into a set theory is that you just end up having more complicated shit than if you're just talking about the set of horses or this bunch of perceptions being grouped into horse, right? That's just sets. There's no theory involved there. 
the theory comes in with what you're allowed to do with sets and all the operations, right? So the union of two sets and the, there's a whole theoretical apparatus associated with sets in the same way as with math. And I think that plays some role in with Carnap, it's very complicated. And we read it and discussed it, and I still don't understand it. So, <laughs> so there were two innov- conceptual innovations that Quine was telling us about. One was contextual definition, and the other, you know, we can even do away with contextual definitions if we can add set theory concepts and then talk of the external world as a logical construction of sense data. So you get sense data, logic, set theory. That should allow us to construct our science and just the way we talk about physical bodies and all the rest of it. And that would be great, he says, if we could do that. But again, so even with set theory, even though that's kind of a flaw, <laughs> it'd be great if we could do that, but we can't because of the problem of induction. Our generalizations always cover more than we can observe. So we just come up against the same sort of problem that he's described before. For the thrilling conclusion of this essay, I need to come back for part two. For you folks that are not yet supporters, you actually do get to hear part two. It's not hidden from the world anymore. Instead, it will come out next week. If you were a supporter, you'd be able to listen to it right now, but you can still hear it. But there will be a part three that will come out after that that will be restricted to the supporters. So you might as well just kind of do it right now anyway. And you can find out about those options at partiallyexaminedlife.com slash support. Finally, I do have two quick announcements. I have a book that is coming out on June 7th. It is available for pre-order now. It's called Philosophy for Teens, Core Concepts and Life's Biggest Questions Examined. It is something that I was hired to write. They gave me an exact outline to follow. I got to figure out which philosophers I was going to talk about, but I had very tight word count restrictions. I had to write at the level that a 12-year-old would understand. So it is an interesting combination of what you might hear me doing here, but yet not. So I will link to the order page from partiallyexaminedlife.com, the blog associated with this, or just look up Philosophy for Teens or my name on Amazon, or wherever you buy your books. Now, there is no audiobook version of that. They did not want to hire me to do that. In fact, I don't even own the rights, so I cannot legally just do it and release it to you. But I am going to do some readings for it to release only for supporters of my Philosophy versus Improv podcast, because I'm really pushing for a season two of that to happen and we don't have enough commercials or supporters right now to make that happen. So I'm putting it up as bonus content there, patreon.com slash philosophy improv. I will have the first segment of that up this week. Besides which as a supporter of that podcast, you then get to hear our after talks with the various guests. And this week we have Babette Babich, a legitimate philosophy professor, the person who compiled, who wrote some of the secondary literature we were talking about with regard to Hume's essay on the standard of taste. So she is great. And that podcast, as silly as its format is, can actually be an outlet for my talking to professors like that, if you will help me fund a season two. Thanks. 